War and Peace, Book One, Chapter Two, read for LibriVox.org by Stuart Wills. Chapter Two, Anna Pavlovna's drawing room was gradually filling. The highest Petersburg society was assembled there, people differing widely in age and character, but alike in the social circle to which they belonged. Prince Vasily's daughter, the beautiful Helena, came to take her father to the ambassador's entertainment. She wore a ball dress, and her badge was maid of honor. The youthful little Princess Bolkonskaya, known as la femme la plus séduisante de Petersburg, the most fascinating woman in Petersburg, was also there. She had been married during the previous winter, and, being pregnant, did not go to any large gatherings, but only to small receptions. Prince Vasily's son, Hippolyta, had come with Mortmart, whom he introduced. The Abbe Morio and others had also come. To each new arrival Anna Pavlovna said, "'You have not yet seen my aunt,' or, "'You do not know my aunt,' and very gravely conducted him or her to a little old lady wearing large bows of ribbon in her cap, who had come sailing in from another room as soon as the guests began to arrive and slowly turning her eyes from the visitor to her aunt anna pavlovna mentioned each one's name and then left them each visitor performed the ceremony of greeting this old aunt whom not one of them knew not one of them wanted to know and not one of them cared about anna pavlovna observed these greetings with mournful and solemn interest and silent approval the aunt spoke to each of them in the same words, about their health and her own, and the health of Her Majesty, who, thank God, was better to-day. And each visitor, though politeness prevented his showing impatience, left the old woman with a sense of relief at having performed a vexatious duty, and did not return to her the whole evening. The young Princess Bolkonskaya had brought some work in a gold-embroidered velvet bag. Her pretty little upper lip, on which a delicate dark down was just perceptible, was too short for her teeth, but it lifted all the more sweetly and was especially charming when she occasionally drew it down to meet the lower lip. As is always the case with a thoroughly attractive woman, her defect, the shortness of her upper lip and her half-open mouth, seemed to be her own special and peculiar form of beauty. Everyone brightened at the sight of this pretty young woman, so soon to become a mother, so full of life and health, and carrying her burden so lightly. Old men and dull, dispirited young ones, who looked at her, after being in her company and talking to her for a little while, felt as if they too were becoming, like her, full of life and health. All who talked to her, and at each word saw her bright smile and the constant gleam of her white teeth, thought that they were in a specially amiable mood that day. The little princess went round the table with quick, short, swaying steps, her work-bag on her arm, and, gaily spreading out her dress, sat down on a sofa near the silver samovar, as if all she was doing was a pleasure to herself and to all around her. I have brought my work, she said in French, displaying her bag and addressing all present. Mind, Annette, I hope you have not played a wicked trick on me, she added, turning to her hostess. You wrote that it was to be quite a small reception, and just see how badly I am dressed. And she spread out her arms to show her short-waisted, lace-trimmed, dainty gray dress, girdled with a broad ribbon just below the breast. Soyez tranquille, Lisa. You will always be prettier than any one else, replied Anna Pavlovna. You know, said the princess, in the same tone of voice, and still in French, turning to a general, my husband is deserting me. He is going to get himself killed. Tell me what this wretched war is for, she added, addressing Prince Vasily, and without waiting for an answer she turned to speak to his daughter, the beautiful Helena. "'What a delightful woman this little princess is,' said Prince Vasily to Anna Pavlovna. One of the next arrivals was a stout, heavily built young man, with close-cropped hair, spectacles, 
the light-coloured breeches fashionable at that time, a very high ruffle, and a brown dress coat. This stout young man was an illegitimate son of Count Bezhukov, a well-known grandee of Catherine's time, who now lay dying in Moscow. The young man had not yet entered either the military or civil service, as he had only just returned from abroad, where he had been educated, and this was his first appearance in society. Anna Pavlovna greeted him with the nod she accorded to the lowest hierarchy in her drawing-room. But, in spite of this lowest-grade greeting, a look of anxiety and fear, as at the sight of something too large and unsuited to the place, came over her face when she saw Pierre enter. Though he was certainly rather bigger than the other men in the room, her anxiety could only have reference to the clever, though shy, but observant and natural expression, which distinguished him from every one else in that drawing-room. "'It is very good of you, Monsieur Pierre, to come and visit a poor invalid,' said Anna Pavlovna, exchanging an alarmed glance with her aunt, as she conducted him to her. Pierre murmured something unintelligible, and continued to look round as if in search of something. On his way to the aunt, he bowed to the little princess with a pleased smile, as to an intimate acquaintance. Anna Pavlovna's alarm was justified, for Pierre turned away from the aunt without waiting to hear her speech about Her Majesty's health. Anna Pavlovna, in dismay, detained him with the words, "'Do you know the Abbe Morio? He is a most interesting man.' "'Yes, I have heard of his scheme for perpetual peace, and it is very interesting.' but hardly feasible. "'You think so,' rejoined Anna Pavlovna, in order to say something, and get away to attend to her duties as hostess. But Pierre now committed a reverse act of impoliteness. First he had left a lady before she had finished speaking to him, and now she continued to speak to another who wished to get away. With his head bent, and his big feet spread apart, he began explaining his reasons for thinking the abbé's plan chimerical. "'We will talk of it later,' said Anna Pavlovna, with a smile. And, having got rid of this young man who did not know how to behave, she resumed her duties as hostess, and continued to listen and watch, ready to help at any point where the conversation might happen to flag. As the foreman of a spinning-mill, when he has set the hands to work, goes round and notices here a spindle that has stopped, or there one that creaks and makes more noise than it should, and hastens to check the machine, or set it in proper motion, so Anna Pavlovna moved about her drawing-room, approaching now a silent, now a too noisy group, and by a word or slight rearrangement kept the conversational machine in steady, proper, and regular motion. But amid these cares her anxiety about Pierre was evident. She kept an anxious watch on him when he approached the group round Mortemart, to listen to what was being said there, and again when he passed to another group whose centre was the abbé. Pierre had been educated abroad, and this reception at Anna Pavlovna's was the first he had attended in Russia. He knew that all the intellectual lights of Petersburg were gathered there, and, like a child in a toy-shop, didn't know which way to look, afraid of missing any clever conversation that was to be heard. Seeing the self-confident and refined expression on the faces of those present, he was always expecting to hear something very profound. At last he came up to Morio. Here the conversation seemed interesting, and he stood waiting for an opportunity to express his own views, as young people are fond of doing. End of chapter 2